Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com runs down the major markets. The Dow was down nine of the last 10 days, having its worst week since March 2023. Gold, on the other hand, hit record highs. Crude is marching higher. And who knew cocoa could be this hot? Author of the second edition of When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash, Hilliard Macbeth, gives a good rundown of the state of Canadian real estate, doesn't think extending mortgage amortization to 30 years is the solution to the Canadian housing crisis because of the extra money it will suck out of the pockets of new home buyers. He also wonders where all the copper will come from for the push to the electrification of everything. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from RecycleCo Director of Marketing, Tony Mitchell. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMY ZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on X at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Always a pleasure, Jim. Ross, the stock market, uh, let's say it's interesting right now. <laughs> it, let's say it is. I mean, we use, we're used we getting so used to eight weeks up, nine weeks up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and now we're getting things like... Uh, the Dow Industrial is down for nine out of ten days, uh, having its worst week since March of 2023. Um, other indices rolling over and having pretty bad weeks. Uh, the S&P um, uh, just getting back and kissing its 50-day average for the first time since we took off from the lows back in uh, October the 31st. The NASDAQ, um, the triple Qs there. Uh, got a good sell signal on that one on the weekly charts uh, here uh, about four weeks ago. And um, it's just been slowly rolling over. And, you know, tops typically are not one-day events. Uh, they are things that occur, uh, especially in indices. They take time to develop. Maybe on individual stocks where you get a spike up and that can be the end of the move, but not in the indices. Those tend to be... As I say, rolling affairs, um, things like the NASDAQ has been the better part now of six weeks of going nowhere. And uh, if it starts to roll over through its support levels, which aren't uh, too much below this week's lows, then I think it could gain a little bit of momentum. You know, we've been saying to keep your stops reasonably tight because uh, each one of these stair steps up has got to maintain um, good support on their pullbacks, so uh, make sure that you're uh, not overstaying the welcome if you've been in there for months and months on this on this move. Well, people always wonder, should I just hold on to this? Uh, should I sell now, anticipating a bigger drop, or can you tell right now? No, well, I think in some of these indices, yes, you can tell. Um, things like the Dow Web's getting a little oversold right now. It might get a little bit of a bounce, but, um, you know, we're uh, we're at the point of the market. Uh, we've had the best six months of the year, quote-unquote. Uh, so you would expect to see a deeper correction. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the levels that we would be looking at, uh, be like 20 or 50 um, week moving averages, which are another 5% or 10% below here. So if you're not comfortable with that type of action, um, take some money off, off the table. Um, if you are somebody who participates in the option market, then it, it's a good time to be selling some call options, taking some premium uh, while the market uh, continues to go through a consolidation and pullback. So that's uh, there's a little bit of something for everybody right now. 
What's happening with gold? Uh, big week in the gold market. It uh, managed to uh, push through 2400 for the first time in history. Uh, and uh, this sort of on the on the uh, the coattails of the geopolitical tensions, uh, Iran uh, uh, versus Israel. Uh, are we going to see anything big over this weekend as far as uh, a, uh, a conflict, military conflicts that anybody knows? So because of that, you had a really good two or three day run in the gold market, but. By the end of the week, uh, 93, 90, I guess $95 range on gold gave back all of the previous day's run. But overall, it's, uh, it's a week with uh, reasonable action on the upside, but uh, the daily action looks pretty rough. Interestingly, um, on the commitment of traders' numbers, looking at those, um, both gold and silver, uh, there was very, very little action. Uh, in the speculative and commercial positions. The, uh, you would expect that as uh, we've been gaining momentum slowly here and stair-stepping up on the gold market, that you'd get a, a fair number of new participants in the market. But overall, I think it was uh, the COT numbers on gold were down about 4,700 contracts on the net positions. Uh, silver was pretty much unchanged. So you really have got uh, a lot of people who are still sitting on the sidelines and not willing to get on this bandwagon. And um, clearly, um, there are people that I'm aware of who are, you know, just that way. They uh, they didn't get on board on the initial breakouts, and they've been afraid to uh, step in as things have started to go. Um, I think you're, you know, like the equity market coming off the October low, you will get minor corrections along the way, and you've got to be looking for those minor oversold uh, opportunities to uh, step into those markets. On the cryptocurrency front, uh, Bitcoin losing a big chunk along with Ethereum. Yes, uh, the uh, you know the, we had uh, good corrections there, uh, and uh, the better part of uh, well. Uh, I guess, you know, we were over 72,000 a month ago. We tested 72,000 again, uh, two more times. And uh, we were really boxing ourselves in. On the low side, support has been at 61,000, then 64, and now 65,000. So um, the consolidation pattern that we're in um, could very easily lead to the next move on the upside. Typically, uh, we've had... Uh, on the weekly charts, um, 10 good exponential runs on the upside uh, in the last 15, 10 years. And um, the 50-day moving average has become the support level after those moves. And in this case, we've come back close to that moving average twice. It now sits just uh, around 64,000. So if uh, next week, we were to have a little bit of a, a blip and drop through that 64,000 and then make a turn. I'd be very interested in uh, getting on board that one because uh, having tested the old highs, uh, there is pretty good potential for this thing to, uh, to come to life again. Coco is super hot. You might it, burn it, your lips on this. <laughs> You know, you know, just when you think things have run their course, uh, things like uh, cocoa, we had, uh, you know, I look at the COT commitment of traders numbers uh, very regularly. And uh, on um, cocoa, uh, you know, this has been running because of conditions uh, down in West Africa. But the uh, we had a small pullback here at 8,000 uh, the better part of three weeks ago. And we got a buy signal on our COT um, model that we have. And, you know, it's the kind of thing when you're up that far, I really question what the potential is. But the reality is um, when uh, the specs start to trade against the position and the commercials don't, uh, you want to get on board that trend. So here we are. We've gone in a matter of three weeks. We've gone from 8,000 to uh, 10,400. So um, this one, uh, for all that it's overbought, 
it still has legs, uh, and I would say uh, unless it breaks below 9,000, um, you want to make sure that you're picking up uh, all your uh, chocolate goodies uh, right now uh, rather than waiting <laughs> another few months. What's going on with copper? Uh, copper's been one of the good, solid markets. Uh, that one has uh, had the, uh, the, uh, the move that you would expect as far as uh, the seasonal is concerned. Uh, we've been very happy with uh, the action there. And um, the, at this point, the open interest there, uh, we saw 22,000 net new positions in copper on this rally. Uh, so we've gone from you know four dollar well we were three seventy uh, back in February uh, paused at four twelve and now we're up uh, in the four thirties so this is one of the market that's got steam behind it um, hopefully it gets a little bit of a correction I would think not too big but uh, the uh, you know conditions that uh, economically uh, if things are starting to pick up here. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised that uh, you see it elsewhere. And, you know, when you see a good move in copper, then you tend to see another move as far as inflation is concerned. And, you know, we did see the uh, uh, the CPI number this week um, back up. We'll get an annualized rate of 3.5%. So the probability of, um, you know, numerous Fed rate cuts this year uh, seem to be uh, out the window. Um, but uh, and so with that, you know, the bond market had a bad break uh, into the middle of the week. Uh, we got down to 116 on the long bond. That for us is is a really good support area. And if we start to see a reversal here back through uh, 118 and a half to 119, I think you can be pretty much assured that uh, the uh, the bottom is in for bonds. Uh, at least an interim low. This was a good test of the Bollinger Bands. And, uh, you know, anything on the upside might have uh, the potential to run until the summer. And, you know, our long-term model would be um, the uh, this good recovery in bonds, followed by then a, another rolling top and an erosion as we move uh, through the second half of the year. But, uh, from now to the summer, um, look look for potential on the upside. And, uh, wait for the uh, the first signs of a reversal. Don't get on board too soon, but I think that's going to be one where you've got the opportunity to make a few dollars. Apple has decided they're going to get out of the autonomous car business along with watches. They laid off over 600 people. But where is their new pivot? Where are they going now, Ross? Well, they're going to your desktop. They're, they're going back to the Mac. They want to put all the, this AI uh, into the Mac and uh, get you away from um, the uh, being up in the cloud. So interesting action. You know, here we are. Um, the uh, We had some good oversold signals, the better part of... Uh, what is it now? March the 8th. So um, signals there didn't get any really good action out of it, but it has double bottomed uh, around 167, 168, and uh, looks as though it has the opportunity to move here. Uh, we've got, as I say, maybe a double bottom, um, and uh, this this one, uh, for all that it's been a, a laggard uh, for most of the uh, the last year and a half, um, it can uh, come back and surprise you. Um, and uh, I've seen that many, many times in Apple. So, um, you know, um, if there's one to be looking at, uh, take one that uh, like this that uh, people have been um, stepping away from. Well, Apple also announced it's working on a domestic robot, so Rosie from the Jetsons can become reality. <laughs> well, put me in line for that one. Russ, always fun chatting with you. It was, Jim. Thank you. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on X at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Hilliard Macbeth, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. 
Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. His website, MacbethMcLeodPartners.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. It's great to be back. Hilliard uh, just taking a look at a release from the Canadian Real Estate Association, prices across the country down 0.3%, but we have hot spots. Uh, what are yeah, they? Where are they and, and why? Yeah, the, um, so the, the big picture is that, uh, probably the peak in the housing market was hit in, um, Toronto and Vancouver in 2021 or 2022 because it shows up on the, the, uh, we publish every month around around this time. We just published it a couple of days ago. The results um, uh, going back quite a few years, and we get our stuff from not from the CREA but from Terranet National Bank, and it shows that uh, there was a peak and then a dip and then another peak and then another dip. But it's generally the the, the trend is down since about two years now, two or three years, and that kind of coincides when interest rates start to go up. And, and the big problems are in the suburbs of uh, Toronto and, and some parts of Vancouver, especially the luxury high-rise condos. And we're still at this phase where the sellers are just reluctant to sell because they just can't stand the idea of, of you know, say, take the Vancouver condo idea. At one point, some of them were getting close to $2,000 a square foot for their condo. And uh, they can't, they can't, they just can't absorb, uh, Mentally, they can't stand the idea of it going below one thousand dollars a foot for the condo, and 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 there might not even be that many buyers. So, is there any point in lowering the price? But in Calgary and Edmonton, the market is still pretty warm. I mean, it's not hot in the sense like it got hot in Vancouver and Toronto, uh, but it's 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 a lot warmer than um, than the rest of the country, and that's probably because uh, incomes are higher in Edmonton, Calgary, and uh, people are moving to Alberta. You know, people are coming here uh, for whatever reason, and uh, everybody's got a different reason probably. But I do see the license plates from BC and you know, even Ontario, which is pretty rare, um, driving around the, when you're out and about. So, so it's it's the um, it's definitely a lot more affordable. Uh, the the incomes are much higher in Alberta compared to Toronto and Vancouver, uh, but of course that doesn't take into consideration the wealth that has been built up, and you know some people with very high, large amounts of wealth in Toronto and Vancouver don't re- report much income. Uh, but in Edmonton, Calgary, it tends to be younger population, and more do, two families working and making good income. So, so, uh, but I just saw a report, um, that, uh, that even with the slight decline we've had in the last two years, uh, Toronto, Vancouver and Hamilton, which is basically a suburb of Toronto now, I guess, uh, are all among the top 10 most unaffordable uh, places to live in in North America. And in fact, uh, Vancouver and Toronto are both ahead of New York City and Manhattan. And that's crazy because the, I, I know that the incomes in Manhattan are much, much higher. There's a large amount of people in Manhattan that are earning in the millions of dollars a year. And there's a very tiny number of people like that in uh, Toronto and Vancouver. So um, you just there's no comparison there. So it is a bubble, and uh, it didn't burst when I thought it was going to burst, but that doesn't mean it won't burst. It just means that it's, it's a delayed uh, bursting. And, of course, the higher interest rates haven't worked their way through the system yet, but they're they're well on the way. Although the government of Canada is trying to make some changes to help people. Uh, well, they're trying to help people, but I, my, my, my idea is they're not really helping them at all. Right. I guess uh, the biggest change from Ottawa, they're going to allow 30-year mortgages again. Yeah, and they're even like, on existing, where this is for uh, new buyers, and uh, but on existing people that have, you know, basically, they never, uh, my, my theory is they never actually got current uh, 
after that moratorium, I don't know if you remember, but there was a moratorium in 2020 after COVID hit and said, you don't have to pay your mortgage for nine months. And uh, then uh, around uh, a year later, when the banks were asked, they said, oh, yeah, we've got all our all our customers are back on track and stuff. And then about a year after that, so 2022, it came out that uh, the variable rate mortgages when interest rates went up, a lot of them were going into extended amortizations of 35, 40, 50 years. Even some of them were infinite amortizations. They weren't even paying the interest on their debt, much less paying down some of the principal. So that's been lingering since uh, basically since 2020, and now we're in 2024. And um, so the government is suggesting that they should be allowed to make that extended amortization, which they never really got back on the 25-year cycle. Um, they should be allowed to make that permanent. But the problem with that is it's crazy because the only person that benefits, the only player in the whole game that benefits from that is the, uh, is the, is the bank, the lender, because, of course, uh, they're, you're going to pay a lot more interest if you extend, even extending your amortization out to 30 years and 25 years. There's a huge jump in the amount of interest you pay over over the term. I I don't have the exact numbers. I saw something today that said it's around at current interest rates of five percent. It's around 50 50 at 30 year amortization. Um, you pay 50 percent in interest, 50 percent in principal. So that basically your home costs you double what you thought it was going to cost you. Um, at six and a half percent. Even uh, 25 year amortization, it's 50 50. So at 35 years, if, the, if rates go up to six or seven percent, like they probably will, um, they're, you're talking about way more interest that you're going to pay over 35 years than you, than you would pay in principle. And, uh, who wins on that? The only person, that, the only entity that wins on that is, is the bank. They get more interest, but the risk of default goes up. So the bank doesn't, it's not a clear, clear cut win for the bank because um, the longer you're, uh, you extend the amortization, the greater the chance that there might become a problem in the household. They might have trouble paying that debt back. So, uh, you know, whether it be illness or unemployment or divorce or whatever, there's lots of things that happen in people's lives. So, um, the uh, you know, it's it, on surface it looks better for the banks, but in, maybe in the long run it's not so good. The uh, the other thing that they announced was on for first time buyers they allow, announced that they would be able to double, almost double their withdrawal from their RSPs and they could uh, buy with a longer amortization, which allows them to, to, to get a bigger loan when they buy uh, the first time, which basically means it allows them to pay more interest over the lifetime of the loan uh, with the longer amortization. And uh, again, that, that actually is primarily aimed at helping some of the um, developers who are stuck at the moment having real difficulty selling some of these uh, places because the uh, the younger people who mo- buy most of the new housing, um, they can't uh, qualify for the loans right now. So this, if they can figure out a way to help them qualify, they might be able to dump some of that inventory onto the, onto the, the young couples that are buying for the first time. But that's not going to help the young couples. Um, it's going to help the uh, developers. So, um, my my feeling would be that it would be better to let the let the system shake itself out, let the developers go bankrupt if that's where they're headed. And um, you know, it's it's unfortunate because uh, building costs went up so much. A lot of these uh, projects, people put a down payment down, and it's a pre-construction condo they call it, and uh, the building costs went up as, as much as eighty percent over the following two years during the construction. So the developer can't raise prices by 80%. Uh, so they're going to be stuck with some big losses or, and they may have to go bankrupt. But, but if that's what has to happen, let it happen. You know, it's like this, uh, getting people deeper into debt, uh, is not gonna, it's not gonna solve the problem. Do you have any uh, ideas on, on what could help? Because apparently Canada's short millions of homes. Well, that's another whole topic. And, uh, um, the uh, the actual uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, needing these homes because there's so many people coming to Canada, and um, but the thing is almost all of the increase in people coming to Canada. So Canada's had a growth rate of one to one and a half percent for many many years, which is a little bit higher than than um, most other countries. But a comparable country like the U.S., it's only slightly higher than the U.S. and um, so what's happened recently, though, in the last couple of years, is a huge surge in temporary 
visitors. So these are people that come. Uh, there's three categories. There's refugees that ask for amnesty. There's uh, students. And there's temporary permits to work. Say, like somebody comes to work in a nursing home or something on a, on a one or two year, or maybe somebody comes to work at a ski hill like Whistler on a one or two year permit. And there's, they, they, they subtract the number of people that leave at the end of those permits. And then they add the number of people that, that are coming, come in on those permits. And, uh, if you take all of that out, it hasn't really changed that much. The, you know, without the huge increase in students and uh, temporary foreign workers, um, the trend is about the same as it's been. So now the government's talking about a huge decrease in the in letting in the number of permits that they're going to let for temporary uh, foreign students and foreign workers, and that is going to hit really hard because uh, those people are needed to, to work, and uh, uh, obviously the universities are going to be short of of students that uh, pay them really good uh, tuition. So, uh, but it's also going to uh, ease up on the crisis, the, so, the so-called crisis in the shortage of homes. So I think it's exaggerated the, um, the, the, unless all of those people now, there is a way that it's not exaggerated. And that is if all those temporary people become, become permanent residents. And that's a, when they move from uh, temporary to permanent, they are now called immigrants. And unfortunately, um, the, uh, all of the news stories that are published about it use the word immigrant, but that's, a mistake because uh, you're not an immigrant until you actually uh, apply for permanent residence. And uh, how many of them are going to apply for permanent residence? I don't know, but there's there's some suggestion that um, that uh, you know many of them might not stay. They might go back to where to or move on to another country, depending on the employment situation, and of course depending on what happens at the end of their school school um, time. So. We don't know. It's a, it's a difficult thing, but, uh, but Canada's been building homes at a very high rate compared to the U.S., much, much higher than the U.S., so I'm skeptical of those ideas that we're going to have a huge shortage of housing. Now, I, the, the, I should add, I should add one more thing. A shortage of, of, uh, there is a shortage of housing, uh, but it's not overall shortage. There's overall, there's a, there's quite a, quite a generous amount of housing. There's a shortage of affordable housing. That's the problem. <laughs> yes, uh, while you were mentioning, uh, nobody wants to build social housing or affordable housing because there's no profit in it. There's very little profit. You know, the, uh, the developer, if you think about it from the developer's point of view, it usually the, the, what happens is the developer spends, a well, in Vancouver, Toronto especially, uh, but even around Edmonton and Calgary, the developer spends a very large amount of money on a plot of land and then they look for opportunities to uh, to develop it, and sometimes it means working with the the planning department of the city to get permission to to build, and then they finally get permission. And this might take five or ten years. So they've been sitting on this land and earning no interest. Hopefully, the value of it goes up, but not necessarily. And then they get they finally get the opportunity to build on it. What are they going to want to build? They're going to want to build the, the 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 structure that gives them the maximum amount of profit. So if they can build two hundred million dollar condos on there, uh, 200 million dollars of, of value and get a, say a 15% profit. That's 30 million dollars. Well, of course, that's what they're going to want to do. They're not going to want to build, um, affordable housing, which might be more in the three or four hundred thousand dollar range and the profit margin would be much skinnier. So the only way that, and, and so the government has done this thing, which is, I don't, it's not really working at all, where they say, you get you can get some help from the government if you set aside a minimum of ten or twenty percent of the units. As I'm putting quotations in mar- if you can imagine quotation marks, air quotes around the word affordable, because all it is is it has to be um, I forget the percentage, but it's something like twenty percent cheaper than the the other units in the building. Well, that's crazy. I mean, like so. In other words, a guy builds uh, two hundred units, a million dollars a unit, and and sets aside maybe. Uh, 20 units at 800,000 a year, and he qualifies as an affordable. That's not what we're, that's not the kind of thing that is needed. What's needed is a whole building of affordable, um, and many, many buildings, not just one, of affordable housing, uh, where the rents can be, you know, under 2,000 a month for something that somebody can live in with a family. And, uh, and then it's all good. But the only way that can happen is if the government gets involved. And the best place for the government to get involved 
is not in the construction phase of the thing, but in the land development phase. So the land, which the developer in the, you know, at the beginning, I said the developer paid a big chunk of money for the land. Um, the land can be made available uh, to the developers at a much cheaper rate if they agreed to build affordable housing. And, and there's all, all the cities have, have land that they can make available. Um, they're just not willing to do it. And one of the reasons I think is that um, they get a lot of pressure from developers to not do it. <laughs> so we had, I, I live in Edmonton, as you know, the, uh, they, they shut down the municipal airport. It's a huge chunk of land. I forget how many acres. It's a huge amount of land. Um, and uh, it was supposed to be developed as for 30,000 uh, housing units, and they were going to have a renewable energy angle to it. Well, only a tiny fraction of those units have been, I don't even know, I don't even know it's a thousand units. It might be only a few hundred units that have been developed. That was a perfect opportunity. And it's very close to downtown as well. So it would be a great, uh, great location to, uh, to do that, but it hasn't gone ahead. And our course, if the city put all that land, uh, started developing housing on all that land, uh, what would happen is that it would decrease the value of the plots of land that the developers own on the outskirts of the building, uh, outskirts of the city that they want to develop for, for, for more expensive housing. So that's probably why the, the city stalled. I, I, I haven't seen anything written on, on, and I haven't asked anybody at the city why they haven't uh, gone ahead with that development. They've also got another Edmonton. They got another land they shut down. Um, we built a new hockey rink close to downtown and there's a, the old hockey rink and the, and the exhibition lands, which is another huge plot of land. It's just sitting there. Nothing's happening. So, um, it's not, it's actually not that hard to do this. It's just a question of, uh, having the political will to, uh, to make it work. But going all the way back to the 1980s, uh, there was a, uh, uh there was a, a, a problem. It started in England, uh, and a, a, and a, a politician named Margaret Thatcher got elected. And, uh, there had been a long period of government involvement in housing and mining and railways and air, all kinds of stuff. They owned an oil company, British Petroleum. They owned all kinds of stuff. And so she decided to privatize it all. And she, along with the help of a fellow named Milton Friedman from the University of Chicago, started a, a, a belief out there that only the private sector can solve these problems. And uh, so it became, the mantra became, let the private sector do it. Well, the private sector is really good at some things, but affordable housing, the private sector is not good at. So now we're living, so that's, 40 years now, 44 years since the, the Thatcher revolution. And, uh, we've had very little affordable public housing built anywhere in the developed countries. And, uh, that's the, uh, that's where we sit. So we got to get back into the business of doing that. Um, I don't know. Does, does it sound like socialism? I don't know. It's not, it's not socialism. It's not capitalism. It's not communism. It's not Marxism. It's just something that we have to do and we have to figure out how to do it. Because whatever it is we're doing now is not working. Well, in Canada, in 92, both the federal liberals and conservatives agreed that Ottawa would no longer be in the social housing business. And I don't recall having to step over a person sleeping in a doorway before 1992. And all yeah. of a sudden, we have homeless people. Well, and the homeless people is just a one little... It's sort of like that tiny bit of the of the iceberg that's across above the water, and the ninety yeah. percent is below the water because the other ninety percent are young families, and especially with this huge surge in immigration, you know, some of the some of the temporary residents are going to stay. They they have bigger families if they're younger, and uh, they don't have a place. Like if you've got four kids, try and go try and go rent a place in Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, or Toronto. It's it, you know, the, the, first of all, you probably can't even get a place. And secondly, if you could get a place, uh, the, the, the cost would be much too high. So we're saddling all these people that we actually want to encourage to come to Canada. And we want to encourage young people to, to, to build families and, and, and all of that. And, uh, but we're making it impossible for them to do it. So you have, uh, people, you know, older people living in luxury condos and they can afford it. And no place for the rest of the people to live. And it's, it's crazy. So I, you know, they tried in, um, in the past, they tried different ways to do incentives for the private sector to, um, to, uh, uh, you know, do more affordable housing. 
but uh, none of them have worked uh, because they don't want to give up that valuable plot of land that they maybe have, you know, sat on for 10 years or 15 or 20 years uh, to put it into a, a government housing project. It's not, it's, that wasn't their, that wasn't their, uh, that isn't their first or second or third choice. So I, I don't know how you do it. Um, but uh, I think uh, most cities have quite a bit of land that they could, uh, they could contribute to, to this project. It's just a question of, of there's going to be some major pushback from certain uh, powerful interests against it. But uh, I think it has to be done. Commercial real estate, has that hit the bubble and is bursting? The bursting of the bubble is, is I, it, you know, what I've asked as soon as the, from the, from the, before my first book came out about the bursting of the bubble, uh, of course, people wanted to know when, and then also they wanted to know, um, well, how do you know the bubble has burst? And uh, so we talked about 40%, 50%, somewhere in that range. You know, that's, that's what happened in... Um, the official numbers in the U.S., uh, the housing market, the housing bubble in the U.S. in 2006, 2007, by 2010, it had dropped 38%. So that's probably a good indicator uh, where the bubble starts. But the commercial real estate, especially office, now it's, it's the problem with saying commercial is there's there's all kinds of, there's the, there's, there's the shopping centers, there's the office towers, there's an industrial space and there's warehouse storage and all that. And they're all different. Uh, they all operate on different cycles and that. But the one that really stands out is the high-rise office tower. And uh, some phenomenal numbers have just come out in the last week. Um, and I can't remember the American cities, uh, but uh, things like a $250 million office tower that sold for $3.5 million. Well, that is like an unbelievable number because it would cost – more than three and a half million dollars to just demolish that building. And then you'd have a nice plot of land probably right near the center of the city. If anybody wants land near the center of the city anymore. Um, so that's basically, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the buyers getting it for really cheap. And, uh, uh, so obviously those, these buildings, of course, they're not uh, very well, very well occupied. Some of them have like 50, 50% ocup, occupied them. They're probably not even 50% occupied if you dig in the details because there's leases that are coming up for maturity and the, and the person, the, the person that's using the space doesn't want to renew it at the same amount of, they want to take less space and that sort of thing. So, uh, you'd have to look, but, but, even places like Toronto have got 16% office, office um, vacancy. And of course, Edmonton and Calgary are much higher than that. So, so uh, it's like, it's definitely a, a, the bubble is bursting. And uh, now a lot of people don't want, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, a lot of people don't want these numbers like going from 200 million down to less than 5 million. They don't want these numbers published because <laughs> they, ha- the problem they have is that they, uh, They've got the financing against some of these uh, their holdings, and now they have to really struggle to to uh, the auditor's going to say, well, how come you're still holding that building at two hundred million dollars on the balance sheet when one similar to it just sold for less than ten million dollars? And so that's the problem, and um, so that's why you haven't seen uh, very many public. And uh, you know, I've been watching fairly closely, and it's only recently that uh, these things have started. A few months ago, a great big company, a Canadian company called Brookfield. They defaulted on a couple of buildings in Los Angeles. Prime, the top buildings, and Brookfield tends to only own the top office buildings in any city that they go into. And uh, Los Angeles, they own two of the of the, the most uh, desirable uh, office towers, and they defaulted on the on them. So what the way it works in that business is you can walk away. Unlike a house in Canada, you can't walk away, but. In, the, in that business, you can walk away, and all the lender, the lender can't come after Brookfield for the deficit. The lender now owns the building, and that's their that's their remedy. They get to they get to take over ownership of the building if if Brookfield defaults. So Brookfield just stops making the payments on the loan, and the lender, after a few months, and some maybe some legal legal uh, papers exchanged, ends up owning the building. So. And, but the but the but the debt on those buildings maybe was fifty sixty seventy percent at the most probably the the, the so 
So they're basically the Brookfield's walking away from the equity in the in the building. But even that fifty percent, let's say it was fifty percent, um, if it was a hundred million, two hundred million dollar building, uh, now the debt is hundred million. So now the the lenders the lenders have got it for the equivalent of a hundred million by taking it over. But maybe that's still far too high. So that's definitely a, a, a crash, a bursting of a bubble. And anything over, say, 40% would be considered a crash, especially when uh, it was pretty universal, um, the view that real estate prices always go up, they never go down. And when people say that, they don't they don't mean just housing. They mean in general real estate, you know, hotels, uh, um, office towers, shopping malls, and all that. And, and gradually, one by one, the uh, the shopping malls, of course, uh, they went down in value quite a few years ago. Uh, now the office towers are going. Uh, hotels are still pretty good, I think. And then, of course, the residential real estate has, hung, has held on really well because they've got a lot of individual buyers out there who are getting uh, mortgages from the lenders and going in and putting their, their down payment down and a lot of government uh, rules that, allow them to borrow a large, large amount of money, probably way more than they should be borrowing to keep that, um, that game going. But, uh, I think eventually it'll, it'll, it'll hit the residential market as well. Uh, Vancouver had a shortage of warehouse space around the port. Uh, is that still a hot market? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's, there's the, the hottest thing that you hear about right now is, is artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, of course, that the way the way people are playing that is um, with the chips, and the, the, so there's very powerful computer chips that uh, allow artificial intelligence to develop. And um, the number one company in the world is Nvidia, and so that's been around for a few months. And everybody, you know, everybody has to make an announcement. Apple just announced. <laughs> this is really funny, actually. Apple just announced um, that they're going to have a whole new. Uh, range of computers brought out with new chips that'll that'll allow them to uh to uh go after artificial intelligence and uh the stock jumped like three or four percent just on the just putting artificial intelligence in, in the title of the news release and um but of course that's kind of exaggerated and uh but then so now that that, that was three or four months ago now the thing is they're talking about these servers and they say okay the data servers, that's the server farms, as they call them, they need to be expanded dramatically because you got two things. You got AI and, uh, and now you've got electrification. You've got all these, all these, um, this, this electrification of society as the energy transition heats up and, uh, we're going to need way more data centers than we used to have. And that's a new thing. So, so, uh, the biggest player in that field was Amazon. Amazon got into it early on when they were selling books online and uh, they built excess capacity in these uh, data centers. And then now everybody's scrambling for, for, um, for data centers. So, and also logistics like delivery, like, um, you know, you, you, you put a punch the buy button and then and about five minutes later it shows up on your front doorstep. It's kind of like, how did they do that? You know, <laughs> and so they got to have a warehouse near to your house, I guess, to, to pull that off. So that's a, that's a hot area. But I would think that the, uh, the, 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 the hottest areas are going to be more likely to be in the, in things like artificial intelligence and, and not, not in, um, not in like uh, buildings. Buildings are kind of, you know, you don't really need a huge building for artificial intelligence. That that chip that NVIDIA announced a couple of weeks ago, the new one, is something like ten times more powerful than the one that they were selling up until up until just then. And uh, now it's not out yet. I think it's a it's a it's a few months or a year away uh, before you can buy it. But everybody's going to wait to buy that one, and they're not going to buy the old A100 chips. They're going to want the new one, and. Uh, so uh, the power that's being packed into these things is, is so much greater than anything that's ever happened before. They won't need as much space. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the uh, the era having, you know, I think about these high-rise, going back to your original question about the commercial real estate and, and the high-rise office towers, um, you know, a lot of that space was required because you had uh, floor after floor after floor of of hundreds of clerks on each floor 
doing the manual work of keeping up the balance sheet of the company or doing the invoicing and sending out uh, uh, different mailing items and that sort of thing. And none of that happens anymore. You know, people don't even, people don't even need uh, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of people that they used to have. And so you don't need space for it. And then the rest of the people that you do need, a lot of them want to work from home. So it's just kind of like, wow. So the, yeah, I don't think it's going to be a shortage of buildings and space. I think it's, it's going to be more a shortage of uh, electrical power because all of these things need electrical power. AI needs electrical power even more than Bitcoin mm-hmm. farming and um, the electrical power thing. That's where the real shortages are, are developing. And uh, of course, the way to play that is with um, commodities like copper and uh, and lithium and that sort of thing, which is another whole story. Well, what is the story of copper? Does Canada have a lot of it? Canada has a lot of copper. Uh, uh, Canadians don't necessarily own the mines anymore, but <laughs> the mines, some of the mines are here. Canada has a lot of nickel, but it's owned mostly by a, Briti- a, a Brazilian company called Vale. It used to be Inco, used to be the big, the biggest nickel company in the world. Um, but that's changing very rapidly. And uh, copper, uh, the thing about copper is it's kind of like people talk about nickel and they talk about different uh, lithium and different elements. But copper is interesting because um, an electric car has a lot more copper in it than a uh, a regular car, mostly because of the of the battery, but also because of, no, no, not so much of the battery. That's the lithium. It's the motors. But it's the motors. The motors are a huge portion. Like uh, most of these cars now have have two motors. Um, my uh, Tesla has three motors, and uh, some of them have one motor. But I think most most it'll settle in around two or three motors. Uh, and it could some of them might even have four motors, one for each wheel, and. Uh, there's a huge amount of copper in those in those uh, in those motors, and, and but then you think about all the connectors too. Like like there there is a huge backlog of uh, connect connection points to the grid uh, from the, all the new solar and wind and, and battery storage that's being built in the U.S. Um, it's it's an enormous uh, amount, and it, the wait now is out to two or three years uh, to get your project connected to the grid, and they're going to have to fix that and. Uh, that requires a lot of copper because those uh, those electric wires usually are, are are have copper in them, and sometimes a lot of copper, depending on the voltage. So- yeah, Hilliard, Hilliard uh, the hard numbers here: an electric vehicle uses two hundred seventy seven percent more copper than an ICE vehicle. That's one hundred eighty three pounds or eighty three kilos. Yeah, and that's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and then. So on top of that, there's a company, there's a Canadian company called First Quantum that has a really good copper mine in Panama, and the government just uh, forced them to shut it down because there was a dispute over who's going to, the well, profits out of this mine are going to be enormous, and uh, the government said we want a bigger share of the profits, and they couldn't agree, and um, and now the thing's been shut down for several months. So uh, that's four hundred thousand tons a year of copper production that's been taken off the market. So. So that's the sort of thing that um, obviously that'll I think that'll come back on the market. Uh, although the share price of First Quantum doesn't reflect it yet, but uh, I think eventually it'll come back on again. Uh, probably the reason the share price hasn't gone back up that much is because it, to get it back on, on, they might have to give up a big sh- uh, share of the ownership of it to the to the government of Panama. But Zambia's got a huge amount of copper. Um, uh, Indonesia is the, is now the world leader in nickel by far. And of course, all of these materials seem to end up in China to be refined. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, uh, you know, that's that's the thing. And here we are uh, in Canada, we're you know amending the rules of whether your, whether your mortars can be thirty years or thirty five years, and uh, it, it's crazy. I mean, it's just um, we need to um, we need to get going really faster. But part of the problem with mining in Canada is. Uh, I, I, I'm sure if the copper price goes up, like it probably will, there's a whole bunch more copper mines that uh, that even the mining companies know they know their ore bodies there, but they couldn't develop it at the cost uh, because the price wasn't low enough. But now, uh, if a higher price is there and it's guaranteed that it'll stay up there for a while, they can go ahead and and uh, apply for approval. But the problem in Canada is the approval process is so long. And uh, it's very, very difficult. Now you've got provincial, you've got federal, you get environmental, 
you got uh, you know you got indigenous uh, claims. Uh, it's just a lot of these mines are in BC, and some of them are in northern Ontario. A lot of them are in Quebec. So uh, there maybe needs to be some kind of a, of a, a special effort made to to fast track some of these developments uh, and uh, get this thing going. Otherwise, we we're at the risk of being left behind in Canada. Well, I know climate change is a big topic, but I saw two reports that said the country that will benefit the most from a warmer climate is Canada, basically <laughs> because the ice fields retreat and all of these minerals are exposed that you can now use. Yes, but the problem with that is that, the, that all of our fresh water comes from the ice fields. I was just shocked to find out that uh, glaciers and ice fields are where all, almost all of the fresh water in the world uh are stored uh, like in the the lakes and the rivers have almost no uh, amount of fresh water and the groundwater, although in Canada, the groundwater might be a little bit more available for a little while longer. Um, in most of the parts of North America, south of us, the groundwater is basically uh, depleted. So, so uh, if the, if the glaciers retreat, <laughs> it would be, we'll have all these minerals, but we won't have any, um, we won't have any uh, fresh water to uh, to to uh, for the workers to drink. Plus, a lot of these mining operations they need water. Uh, they need a large amount of water. Agriculture needs a lot. You know, beef, cattle needs huge amounts of water. So we uh, we need to we need to make sure that the I, I, can you do anything about it? I don't know if you could do anything about glaciers melting, but um, it's a bit uh, of a concern that. Uh, that if it warms and, and you know, Northern Canada, there's a huge space in Northern Canada where nobody, you know, almost nobody lives and there's lots of fresh water up there, um, in the lakes and the, and the, and, uh, so that may be an area where we might all end up moving to extend, uh, a, a nice life for a few more years, a few more decades. But, um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a. Uh, uh, there's a lot of changes coming, and uh, they're coming very rapidly. And I think the 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 bet that electrification of everything is going to go ahead faster than people think is a pretty good bet. And um, if people want to invest in that, they, you know, of course they should be careful to diversify because uh, there's always surprises like that. Like those guys in the first quantum thought they had a really good deal in Panama, except the government, <laughs> the government canceled their lease, right? So, uh, that's why you have to diversify and make sure you got at least 10 or 15 or 20 different projects that you, that you own so that you don't get shocked by any one particular uh, event, unforeseen event like well, that. Well, your Danielle Smith, the premier of Alberta is a unpredictable event canceling uh, wind turbine and solar projects yeah well she's allowing them now but that the, the the moratorium ended in march i think uh, she put a six-month moratorium on it i think it was six months um uh and now but now the new rules are are out and uh there's a 35 kilometer square kilometer buffer so <laughs> you, you you can have you can have a view of a bunch of, of pump jacks pumping oil, but you're not allowed to have a view of a of a single uh, wind turbine in that 35, and definitely no solar panels, right? So it's a, it's pretty interesting to compare Alberta and Texas because Texas is going ahead. Texas is, has the most rapid development of winds, uh, solar, and and battery storage, and like utility scale battery storage of uh, anywhere in North America. But they're also the 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 biggest producer of oil with the shale oil in West Texas. So they seem to be able to, in a very right, right wing government in Texas, there's no doubt it's a very right wing government, but they seem to be able to handle the, uh, the, um, the two at the same time. But in Alberta, we're kind of stuck uh, on the, you know, sort of um, thinking that oil and gas is going to be around forever and uh, try and slow down the transition to uh, wind and solar as much as possible. And uh, that's probably a mistake, but who knows? I mean, there's going to be an election at some point, and uh, we'll see uh, if what people think about that. Well, Alberta is also uh, 
not openly declared war in Ottawa, but they might as well. Uh, now Danielle Smith is uh, proposing a law that every federal program in Alberta has to go through a panel to see if it matches up with what Alberta wants. And the mayor of yeah. Calgary is totally upset about that because her city was about to benefit with uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of federal help to improve housing in a city where uh, she pointed out quite correctly that Calgary is the economic or the heart of Canada's economic engine. And uh, all these people are flocking there to take advantage of that. But if they don't have enough housing, uh, you are just put a, a bullet in Canada's economic heart. Yeah, and you know it's interesting because uh, the uh, you know the, the the cities have uh, the cities have benefited from some of these uh, federal you know every every time there's a big project the federal government puts in a lot of money the, the province puts in some amount of money but less and then the municipality puts in very little money because they have very little money uh, and sometimes they get they get lured into doing stuff that they shouldn't do like. <laughs> Uh, you know, because they, they, they look at the, the federal government dangles his money out and they say, oh, we can't, we can't, we can't pass up on that. We gotta, so they scramble around, try and do it, and then they get in over their heads or whatever. But, um, but, uh, the federal government's always gonna try and influence uh, stuff in Alberta. And the likely opponent in the next election, if, uh, if the NDP is the uh, primary opposition in Alberta, which it probably will be, they're having a leadership race right now, and the former mayor of Calgary, Nenshi is his name, who is very popular in Calgary. Um, I don't know how popular he'll be in the rest of Alberta, but he's very popular in Calgary. Um, he's probably going to get the nomination for the NDP, and then so when the next election comes up, uh, Daniel Smith will be uh, uh, against uh, going against him. So it'll be interesting if she, uh, if she can pull this off, but I, I you know, it's, it's kind of like she's preaching to the choir, uh, with this federal government, the hate for, uh, Justin Trudeau and the hate for Ottawa is one thing. And it's always been a political, uh, advantage in Alberta to, to play that, uh, play, play the, touch those heartstrings, uh, back going back to Peter Lougheed and, and Pierre Trudeau. Uh, but, you know, Lougheed was smart enough to do it as a, as a, like a public, um, kind of a way of stirring up the, the troops and, you know, kind of getting some emotions into it. But he never, ever went to the thing where he didn't, uh, you know, still cooperate with the other provinces and with the federal government. So um, the current premier, Daniel Smith, has taken it to another whole level, and I don't know if she's trying to separate from Canada or what she's trying to do, but um, it uh, it's, it's a dangerous game that she's playing. Well, there's also a movement in Alberta to become the 51st American state. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You think Ottawa treated us badly? You can imagine what how we get treated in the U.S. It's like, I mean, our big problem, you know, Alberta. One of the reasons that Alberta is so enamored with the U.S. is because we sell all, all our oil to the U.S. Pretty much all of our oil to the U.S. Um, and uh, and the U.S. has been an eager buyer of our oil, and so they, you know, the pipelines go south. And there's now a new pipeline that's been expanded that goes west. It's going to open up soon. There's 775,000 barrels, um, so it's a tripling of its size, the Trans Mountain. But there's three or three and a half million barrels that go south uh, every day. Uh, most of it from the oil sands it goes to uh, different refineries in the U.S. So that's by far the biggest. Uh, but the problem is that um, the U.S. is now the biggest producer of oil in the world. They're even exporting. The U.S. has become a huge exporter of oil. So we're, our main customer is the U.S., uh, but they have found a whole bunch of oil in uh, Texas, uh, in the shale oil and elsewhere, uh, where they don't need our oil as much as they did before. So um, I don't know that we necessarily would be treated very well by uh, – by, I, I think the U.S. might like to – to uh, encourage us to uh, break up Canada, because that would make their uh, their dealings with Canada easier. Uh, if they want to, if you know, if they have different things they want to do, and they're things that Canada normally would oppose. But um, uh, you know, they might like our water, for example. And uh, but um, but I don't think they really would do it to be nice to us. I think they 
to to use us, you know. So I think we'd be better off to stay uh, stay in Canada and uh, you know try and present a a united front in any negotiations between the U.S. We're we're at a real disadvantage negotiating with the U.S. Obviously, because they uh, they're so much more powerful than we are, so much bigger. Um, for instance, one thing that the, nobody talks about, and I don't know when it's going to come into the news, if ever, but the Columbia River Water Sharing Treaty is coming up for renewal. Um, I think it was a 50-year agreement, and it's, it's actually expires in September of this year. Uh, now there's like a five-year period when you it carries on. If there's no agreement at the end of the expiry, there's a, a several-year Agreement. I know the committee has been meeting for several years now to to resolve uh, any issues that are outstanding. But that's going to be a big discussion because California, Nevada, especially Arizona, they are all uh, desperate for water, and um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that all shakes out. With uh, so the stronger Canada is to represent uh, as a united front against the in the negotiations the better chance we have of, of, of getting a good deal. but uh, Well, China and Russia would love to see the U.S. have a civil war and split up into separate states because individually they're much weaker than the United States. Exactly, yeah. The United States is the powerful, most powerful country in the world, partly because of their wealth, but a lot of it's because of their military might, you know. And uh, uh, so, uh, but they've only got 5% of the world population, so... Canada's got less than less than a tenth of that, so um, or about a tenth of that. So uh, so five and a half percent combined mm-hmm. against some very large countries like China and India, and um, and uh, so we we should stick together, I think. And uh, for all of you Tesla lovers, uh, a woman was trapped in her Tesla in 115 degree Fahrenheit heat during a computer update. She was locked inside her vehicle for 40 minutes because you need an active computer <laughs> to open the doors. Oh, my God. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> that sounds like one of those things. But, you know, uh, on a more positive note, uh, uh, I can I can report that... Uh, well, so I've had fully self-driving for all of the eight years that I, I, I foolishly, I purchased it on the very first vehicle, which was 2016. So it's now 2015. Actually, last month was the eight-year anniversary. And then I've had, I've upgraded twice. So I've had a, a, another vehicle and then this, this last one, which I bought um, almost three years ago. And each time I've, I've got the fully self-driving, but only in the latest update, which has only came out about three weeks ago, have I been comfortable using the fully self-driving like on a regular basis uh, to go around town and go on the course? It was always pretty good on the highway, uh, but in uh, in the city, if you turned it on and the car was driving you around the city and you got to a, like a traffic circle, for example, you just were holding your breath and praying that it <laughs> didn't do something crazy, right? And uh, now it's much, much better. So it's it's to the point now where I very seldom have to uh, interrupt it. Occasionally I do. Um, if I, one of the things that's a little bit off about it is uh, it doesn't seem to select the right lane sometimes. So I'll, I'll intervene and move it into a better lane. Um, and uh, but left turns are good now. It goes around the traffic circle now. Um, so what they did was they offered on a tr- so this costs money obviously. Um, I think I think I paid eight thousand dollars for it as an extra, and uh, I think the latest number to buy it outright is twelve thousand dollars. But the new thing now is to rent it. So I think it's like seventy nine dollars a month or something like that to rent it. So you can turn it on, and I, I, there must be a minimum commitment in there of a few months. But um, but what they did was they said to everybody that you can have it for free for a month. So they just started that after the latest update. So that was about two weeks ago. And uh, so everybody's driving around in these Teslas with this fully self-driving thing and trying it out. <laughs> so if, if you see a Tesla wandering all over the place, it's probably because the computer's driving the Tesla rather than rather than the person, or maybe the other way around. Right? I don't know. Well, but, Apple uh, has bailed out of the autonomous car business. 
Yes. And uh, also watches. So they laid off 600 people. Now they say they're going to make a domestic robot so you can have a Rosie like in the Jetsons. Well, you know, the the um, the thing about AI, we talked about AI for quite a while there. Hmm. Um, what people haven't really cottoned on to, I think, is that uh, Tesla and Elon Musk have been, they've been doing AI for years now. So this whole fully self-driving thing, originally they were... They had people sort of entering into the computer, into the software, lines of code that would tell it what to do. If you come to this situation and there's there's these people walking across the street, stop the car, you know, don't run into the people. And then, you know, so on and so forth, you know, millions and millions of, of lines of computer programming code. And now, of course, all that's in there. But now what they're doing is they're using AI or they don't call it, they call it a neural network. They don't call it AI. Um and what they're doing is that the cameras in the car are taking in all the situations and seeing how the car responds, seeing if the uh, if the driver uh, intervenes, and learning from the experience of that. And and nobody else in the world, as far as I know, has got anything like that. So there, there's you know it takes you got to have a few million cars on the road, and then you got to have people that um, are driving the cars. And I think that's why they rolled out free self, fully self driving for for a month or two to get additional uh, input into the into the uh, computers that are learning from the the experience of all these all these things so um, eventually hopefully the computer will make it even better and uh, but it's pretty good now and I think it's probably better in the US because they've got almost all of their learning was probably done in the US with US traffic signals and US traffic uh, stop signs and stuff like that but but, uh, but, uh, and I don't know. I haven't tried it when the snow is, you know, a foot thick on the ground. I don't suppose it works all that great at, at that time. And then, of course, in a rainstorm, does it work in a rainstorm? I don't know. So, um, uh, it's, uh, still got a ways to go. But, uh, but yeah, uh, practical applications of AI, uh, a fully automated electric vehicle that could drive around without a driver and could come uh, if you just call for it on your app on your phone within a few minutes and take you to where you want to go, uh, would be amazing. Most people wouldn't need to own a car, right? So that would be, they'd have all these cars out. They'd be, instead of being used 10% of the time, they'd be, they'd be, uh, in use 80, 90% of the time. They just have to stop for a while to, uh, get charged up, but, um, it would change, change the world. Hilliard, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Nice to talk to you again. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. His website, MacbethMcCloudPartners.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark and Hilliard Macbeth. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at housestreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from the Director of Marketing for RecycleCo, Tony Mitchell. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. My guest is Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. Tony, welcome back to Company Showcase. Hey, Jim. It's great to be back. What's the latest on RecycleCo's Taiwan joint venture? Uh, things are going well. Uh, the team, both here in Vancouver and on the ground in Taiwan, are uh, moving the ball ever closer to our end goal of having a 2,000 metric ton a year battery recycling and upcycling plant operational in Taichung late next year. Um, but, you know, I know from the multiple conversations we've had with investors, vendors, and an increasing number of interested parties of late, that everyone is keen to see us become a company with battery recycling operations around the globe, ASAP. 
But the reality is uh, big, ambitious plans such as ours take time, especially as the battery industry is largely still committed to a highly inefficient way of currently handling their battery waste. So it's like trying to turn around an ocean liner. It just doesn't turn on a dime. So while I understand everyone's frustration with the pace of our growth, our fluctuating stock price, et cetera, one thing keeps me focused and excited after all these years of development uh, for our relatively near-term future, our joint venture in Taiwan and how we're rolling it out. It's important for our listeners to keep in mind that how we move forward with our first joint venture plant you know, will set the template for all future operations. So naturally, there will be a lot more work involved with getting this first modular plant set up and operational than it will require for subsequent plants. And while we are focused on getting the plant designed and built on our side and working closely with the team in Taichung, our listeners need to realize that this new joint venture called the RecycleCo Zenith Battery Materials Technology Corporation, which is a mouthful, (laughs) is moving forward in tandem at a great pace. In fact, uh, James Fang, who's head of this first joint venture, is highly proactive in leveraging business relationships he's established over decades of working within Asia. So in anticipation of our plant being operational late next year, James is already having high-level meetings with um, major potential battery production partners in Asia to line up feedstock and process their battery waste materials when we're ready. So his goal, as well as ours, is to make sure that once our $25 million clean spot plant is commissioned, we keep it up and running uh, continuously and generating as much profit as possible. It sounds like there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Yes, Jim, uh, there's a lot going on. And many uh, items for our relatively small but mighty team to juggle. Um, I know it may not seem like much is going on from the outside, but as our interim CEO, uh, Richard Sadowski, recently told me, he doesn't want to put out any fluff information of no consequence He's actively pursuing a number of big opportunities for the company, and going forward, he only wants to make announcements of a substantial nature. So we look forward to seeing the fruits of his labor. And as I've said many times before, but I'll restate it once again, we currently have 23 MOUs with major potential joint venture partners in the battery production and recycling space. And we continue to hear from the industry grapevine and from people we've tested and collaborated with that our patented closed-loop recycling and upcycling process is still the best they've seen, uh, which we find a you know very encouraging. After pioneering, patenting, and proving, we can recycle and upcycle lithium-ion battery waste for uh, direct reuse in new battery materials since 2016. You know, way back when everyone in the battery industry said it was impossible. So. When you keep those facts in mind and that we're still in the very early days of the world's inevitable transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles, we remain highly confident in our future. However, you know, when you take into account all of the above and where our stock price currently sits, which puts us at around a $40 million market cap and we have $17 million in the bank, um, you know, Jim, listeners should please do their due diligence. And this is not investment advice. But our current stock price is a gift to those who can clearly see the lay of the land and wish to get involved. Um, As a quick reminder, back in January of 2021, when we hit an all-time high of 285 a share, our longtime CEO, uh, Larry Ray, used to say, today's highs are tomorrow's lows. And when I see how things are lining up for us as we make the challenging transition from being a junior mining exploration company to a major lithium-ion battery recycling technology partner, our player, uh, sorry, within an industry that's on the cusp of ma- massive growth, I can see just how pressing he was in pursuing the company's current path. So while we could certainly do without the various external factors we have no control over, you know, I still couldn't be more excited to be involved with helping our team and our partners achieve our goal of becoming the gold standard in lithium-ion battery recycling around the globe. So I guess ideas are easy, but making them a reality is pretty tough. Oh, yes. It's, uh, I completely agree with that, Jim. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was, I was making notes for this podcast, and I happened to see a short video clip uh, Elon recently reposted on X. It's just over three minutes of Steve Jobs um, 
talking about what it takes to bring an idea to fruition. He, uh, you know, essentially he summed up the challenges innovators such as ourselves go through, and I thought it apropos of where we stand and what we're going through. So I, I reposted it, um, and I encourage our listeners to watch the clip for themselves on our Twitter page, as they were very wise words and encouraging words from someone who's certainly been there, done that, uh, albeit in a different industry. Where is RecycleCo traded, and how can people get more information about the company? Uh, certainly, Jim. Uh, we're traded on the TSX Venture under the ticker symbol AMY, on the OTCQB under the ticker symbol AMYZF, and the Frankfurt Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol ID4. And you can get more information on our website um, at RecycleCo.com. Tony, thank you so much for the update. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on April 11th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.